Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where today I'm over here working on the ON18 Bandit Canyon layout, finishing up the foam rock work for Six Gun Butte. In a recent video, I demonstrated my three favorite methods for carving rock work out of foam, and a lot of you requested a more detailed explanation on the painting and finishing process. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, my techniques for painting foam rock scenery. And we'll be finishing up Six Gun Butte here in the process. If you didn't happen to catch my video on carving foam rock scenery, you might want to watch that one before you watch this one. So I'll put a link right here, and you can go watch it right now. Don't worry, I'll still be here when you get back. Well, now that everyone's caught up, let's get started painting some rocks. The first thing I want to do is finish filling in a lot of these gaps between the layers of foam. And I'm using some, uh, this is just some household spackling compound that you can pick up at any hardware store. I uh, kind of shove it back in there with my finger, then take a wet paintbrush and go back over it to blend it and feather it into the, uh, the carved foam. Now I've used a lot of different things uh, for this. I've used sculpt mold and um, foam putty, which is you know specifically formulated for this, joint compound, but honestly, after using the foam putty for a while, <laughs> I really can't tell much of a difference between it and uh, spackle. It goes on the same, dries the same, uh, you work with it the same way. So since spackling compound is uh, much more readily available, I'm uh, leaning towards recommending that. Even though it can shrink if you put it on too thick, just have to take care. If it does, it might crack and you might have to go back over it again trick here is to fill this gap without obscuring the, the detail worked so hard to carve in there. If you did watch the rock carving video, you probably noticed that this formation has gotten quite a bit bigger. And I've added this uh, natural bridge that spans the canyon. And this is something I planned on as a scenic highlight from the very beginning. Okay, as soon as all this spackling is dry, this foam will be ready to paint. But before we do that, I want to do some further work on the, around the base of the main rock formation, Six Gun Butte itself. And you might remember that this is carved from some polyurethane foam, while the rest of this is polystyrene. So I'll be counting on the blending and the painting to tie everything together. And I made this piece removable. It actually just slots right into the foam, just like that. And there's a couple of reasons I did it that way. One is to make it easier to work on over the workbench, and two, to be able to move this thing. This layout is supposed to be portable. The entire layout comes off from the stand and will fit through the door and fit in the back of my car, but it won't fit in the back of my car with this attached. So this piece has to be removable. So let's take it over the workbench and uh, finish it up over there. And for this, rather than using the spackle, I'm going to be using some sculpta mold, making up a kind of a thick batch here. And the reason I want to use this instead of spackle is because I've got some gaps I want to fill that are a little bit bigger, kind of create a little slope coming down off of the uh, the butte down to the rocks below. There we go. That's about the way I like it. I don't want it uh, too runny at all. One of my favorite sculpting tools with this is a butter knife. I'm going to work it back into this crack down here. Again, using a wet paintbrush to blend these different materials together. Just putting a little water on there. This is a soft brush. Dip it in the water and then I can uh, just feather these together like that. Just pull that out real thin until one disappears into the other. I'm also using sculpt mold because I want a texture to this. I want it to look like a more of a rocky slope. And since sculpt mold has cellulose in it, it has a little bit of a texture, kind of an oatmeal-like texture. All right, 
Now I need to let all of this dry overnight, both the sculpt mold and the spackle. And then we can start uh, getting some paint on these rocks. Now it's time to talk about color. And I can't tell you how many times I have been asked, uh, what color do you paint your rocks? As if, if I were to tell them, you know, go down to the paint store and pick out, you know, X, Y, Z, your, your rocks will look like this. I'm afraid that's not the way it really works. Um, a much better question to ask is, what is the process? What is the method? What, what are the techniques that you use to get that result? And that, fortunately, is what we're going to be spending the rest of this video talking about, the process and the techniques for getting that result. Um, color is not nearly as important as how the colors relate to each other, particularly on the value scale, but I'll get to that in a minute. The colors that you choose for your scenery should be based on what you observe in nature, what looks good under your specific lighting situation in your layout. Not necessarily the same colors that I use. The colors that I choose, the specific colors that I choose, are probably the least important part of this process. But come over here and take a look at this and I'll show you what I mean. Now here are the three main colors that I use, and I painted them up here on a piece of illustration board so you can see how they relate to each other. We've got a dark shade, a medium shade, and a light shade. But they're all based off of the same color. And how I arrived at these was um, I, I painted some acrylic paint onto a piece of illustration board like this, trying to match some local rock from Sedona took it down to my paint store and had them mix me up a gallon of this color right here, this kind of dark terracotta. And this color is actually an off-the-shelf color known as raw sienna. I mean, it varies from brand to brand, but that's pretty much what this is. And then the lighter shade over here is I took this color and I mixed a whole bunch of white into it to create a highlight color. And I had them mix me up a gallon of this. So then I took this color and this color and mixed them up 50-50 to create this medium tone. So we've got a medium tone, a dark tone, and a light tone. But as I said earlier, the specific colors that I use are not the most important thing. The most important thing is how these colors relate to each other on the value scale. So now I'm going to desaturate this video through the magic of editing so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. This is the important thing, so much more important than the actual colors themselves. A lot of people get hung up on the color, but the values of the colors, that's the thing that matters the most. The value, that's the grayscale from dark to light and how these relate to each other. I had a great art teacher in school that uh, told me something I've never forgotten, that value is to color what rhythm is to music. Without it, the whole thing falls apart. It's so much more important than the specific hues that you get in the color. And with that in mind, we're going to start with this medium color on our scenery. So here I'm just starting with that medium shade, which I've chosen as the scenic base color for everything on the Bandit Canyon layout. And remember, this is just the dark shade and the light shade mixed together 50-50. And now I'm just going to go over all of this new scenery. And I'm using a one inch soft brush for this. You want a softer brush to be able to get back into all of that texture, all those cracks and crevices. And yes, I am working around existing models, trying to be very careful not to get uh, paint on those. Not a process I recommend, by the way. <laughs> if you're smart, you should uh, take those off or cover them up. And this is going to take a minute, so we should probably do it as a time lapse.
taken the top part of the butte off so I can work on it over here at the workbench. Nice thing about this with the polyurethane foam is that uh, this acrylic paint, or this latex paint in this case, is going to seal that so I won't be getting any more dust off of it. Alright, now we take an hour or so and let everything dry before going on to the next step. After letting this dry, my next step is to apply a dark wash. And this, uh, this is an acrylic wash made up of a couple of drops of black and a couple of drops of burnt umber with uh, a whole bunch of water added until it uh, just kind of runs like that. You don't want it too dark. You just want it to soak back into all these cracks and crevices and all of that carved detail. And you can use a big soft brush for this like I'm doing or you can use a spray bottle. Just depends on the situation. I'm using a big soft brush because I don't want to get a dark wash on everything else. And this has the effect of uh, strengthening all the shadows. And it's really going to uh, be more noticeable once we get the final, once we start uh, getting the final uh, paint layers on here. You'll see that shadow showing through from uh, underneath. And I'll do the same thing over here on the rest of this scenery. Just let that run right down the sides of the cliffs. All right. Now we let this dry. All right, I've got my base color on there, my dark wash to darken up the shadows. And now I want to start differentiating some of these layers. So I'm going to go back to the darker scenic base color. This is the one we painted everything with. I'm going to go a shade darker. I'm just going to hit the tops of the rock surfaces like this. This isn't really dry brushing. I'm not. Uh, not removing all the paint from the brush or most of the paint from the brush first. If you've got something that's well textured like this, it'll automatically, when you hit it with a brush, it'll just hit the top surfaces. Just go lightly over it. And this is just, you know, these different colors. This is just representative of the different layers of sandstone we find out here in the southwest. And up here on this top part. I'm going to go over that again with my medium scenic base color. In fact, I'll do this on most of the rocks. That darker wash will show through underneath the lighter color. Now I'm going back over that wet paint I just put on this uh, dark scenic base with the medium. So I'm blending those together right there on the rockwork and creating what's basically a, a third color, a new color. You see how I'm just hitting the top of the texture, not trying to get it back down into the cracks and crevices. I already painted that and I want it to be a shade or two darker. Now I want to bring in the lighter shade, this one to represent maybe some layers of limestone up here. I don't mind if this blends a little bit with the uh, other colors I just put on. I'll pull that down a little bit and blend it with those colors underneath. So you don't want the transitions between the layers to be too harsh, too perfect. Another lighter tan layer here. Now I want to start uh, brushing on some highlights. And the way that works with the three paint color system I've got going here is basically you go back and dry brush on whatever the next lightest color is. So if I use the, the darker red down here at the bottom, I want to go back, find a place where it's dry here, and uh, kind of dry brush over it with the next lighter shade. So this is the base color. Then I'm going to dry brush over it with this middle shade. 
just for the highlights. Just like that, see. Once again, just hitting the very tops of the texture. And then in areas where the, the middle shade is prominent, I'm going to go over those with the lightest shade, very lightly. And then where I've got the lightest shade, I want to bring in some of this uh, unbleached titanium and dry brush over that. So you're always going the next shade lighter. It's a really nice color for limestone too, by the way. Now I decide whether I want to use any special colors other than these, the three basics here. And I think I do. I'll punch this up here and there a little bit. So I'm mixing some burnt sienna in with a darker base color. See that gives a very much more dramatic red. Use that sparingly. Then if I want a darker shade, I might mix in some burnt umber. Nice dark brown. I'm just kind of just feathering this up from the bottom. There's some rocks out in Canyonlands National Park that I know of that are it's exactly that color. So so red brown, they're almost purple. If that makes sense. <laughs> now I can just plug this back into its slot. And then we can paint the rest of the scene the same way, making sure everything blends together the way it should. times I'm just blending these colors right in to each other right on the surface of the scenery working wet into wet with the paint adding some of this burnt sienna down here because I did it on the other side and I want it to match punch all that up coming around over here I want to make sure I match the already established colors in these layers, these rocks right here, make sure everything looks like it goes together. Not too hard to do when you've only got three colors, three main colors I should say. And that's my secret. I keep it simple. Not a whole bunch of different colors. You only need three or four main colors to do this. So what we're doing here basically is contrasting values. The dark, the medium, the light. And in order for that to work, uh, you have to have a darker value that you're brushing the lighter value over the top of. It's, it's really as simple as that. If your values are too close or there's not enough contrast, then um, it's gonna look flat. It's not going to work. And if it does start to look flat, go back with a lighter shade over the top until you work your way all the way up to the brightest highlights. But you don't want to start with the lightest tone because then you've got nowhere to go. If you're already at the highlight color, there's not going to be any contrast. Does that make sense? I hope so. At this point, I'm just kind of looking at this and seeing what else I think it needs. We're, we're pretty close to done. 
uh, but I want to add some desert varnish. And desert varnish are those black mineral streaks you see down the sides of the cliffs out in canyon country. But you don't want to just do straight black because that would be too, well, it would be too black. <laughs> so I want to mix some uh, black in with the scenic base color. And then I just want to kind of dry brush it on in places where it looks like uh, water would run off down the sides of the cliffs. Get a little closer so you can see what I'm doing. A lot of times there'll be like a, a water seep in between layers of rock and you'll see these streaks just coming out from there. Or sometimes they come all the way down from the top. We want to get some down under here. There would be a lot down underneath an overhang like this. Then I like to go back over it, just dry brush a little bit more of that scenic base color over the top, the medium shade. Just tone that down just a little bit. Well, now I'm ready to start adding the final highlights. And for that, I'm going to mix some of my unbleached titanium, which is just a very, very light tan with the lightest scenic base color, the lightest of the three. Since acrylic and latex colors always dry a shade darker than they go on, sometimes it can be hard uh, to determine how much is enough, especially with something like highlights. It just takes a little bit of practice uh, until you get there. And the great thing is, of course, since it's, you know, it's acrylic paint, if you mess up, huh, you can always just paint over it. Like, for example, here I've decided I want this layer of rock to be more dramatic. So I added some, some of that burnt sienna to it just to punch it up. You know, I seldom get these things right the first time. <laughs> Usually end up going back over this several times until I get it looking the way I want it to. You do a you know color layer like this, the key really is to try and keep the transitions as subtle as you can. And that means you know going back over it and dry brushing and feathering. You never want like a harsh line in between these layers of rock. There's always going to be a little bit of spillover. It's going to bleed a little bit from one layer to the next. And you can uh, simulate that pretty well um, by dry brushing. You can see how I brought this color up onto this lip of rock. And now I'm taking this scenic base color and dry brushing downward over the top of that blend those together a little bit. Break it up. Now, back to those final highlights. Especially when I hit the tops of these rocks here with that uh, mixture of unbleached titanium and the light scenic base color. And really just anywhere you think it needs it. it needs to make that pop a little bit. Back up here. And I'll just keep adding more and more of that unbleached titanium to the mix until I get to the lightest value where it's just, you know, almost pure, mostly white. It's not really white, off white. And then there's nowhere to go from there. Then you're done. And with that, I think we're done for now. <laughs>
my method for painting foam rock scenery. And with the completion of Six Gun Butte here, that brings the overall height of the Bandit Canyon Railway up to 72 inches above the floor. 72 inches from the top of the butte to the floor down there below. And it's uh, 80 scale feet from the top of the butte down to track level. You know, I used to be 72 inches tall once upon a time, but you shrink when you get older, and right now, I'm standing on a box. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video today. I hope you got a lot of good stuff out of it. If you did, please hit that like button. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, you can do that by clicking on the logo up here above my right shoulder. You can also follow Thunder Mesa over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see all that's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really like what we're doing here at the channel and want to show your support, you can head on over to patreon.com slash thundermesa like these nice folks did, and show your support there. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.